Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to another episode of the Versa Stars podcast, third season. How my loyal listeners support the show by liking and subscribing. This is an amazing episode because Wells Thompson returns to the mothership to discuss Mechaton. Now come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hi, Mr. Thompson. Thank you for coming back to the Traverse the Stars podcast. Yeah, nice to be here. How are you doing? So my pleasure. Doing well. So I was thinking about Mechaton. So this is the first complete volume um, mm. covering its four issues. Uh, five issues. Five issues. So what do you what did you learn about what did, what did the experience teach you about either the characters or the story or the process? Um, now that you've done five issues that you didn't or or were not positive when you started the first. Uh, I think we started out uh just with a a more rigid idea of what the uh series was going to be you know every we we thought every issue was going to have a new one new mech one new monster uh and one big fight and it turned out that the series just needed to be a lot more fluid than that um to allow those character moments that really i think make the series happen uh i've always said the heart of mechaton is uh is is the relationship between derek and leah's brother and sister uh and how they grow and how they interact with each other. And uh, the fights are a part of that because they have that level of Leah's calling the shots, Derek is in the machine. Uh, but they just needed a lot more time outside of that as well to, to grow as people and to sort of talk through the situation. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not as uh, action heavy as we originally anticipated, but still has a, a bunch of fun fights and a bunch of fun action. And uh, I think it has a lot of room, a lot more room to breathe than we initially expected it to. Now, there's a, there's a character more who has a very interesting uh, thing. Happen to him, but I don't know if I should get spoilers away or it's okay to give the spoilers away, but it's something that I was, I thought about before and I didn't, realize you guys would actually go through and, and do that in the comic. How, how <laughs> yeah, so thing? Uh, without, without giving away too much, one of these sort of lingering hanging questions about this glove, the, the, the premise of the book being that there's a glove that turns anything it punches into a mech. Yeah. And that's really cool. Um, there's sort of a, a, a couple of hints dropped like, oh wait, what happens if we, if, if like we punch a person or we punch a living thing? Um, and uh, it's sort of a, you know, it's sort of a grim, like, oh, let's not find out uh, sort of thing. And, and uh, I think a lot of people expected us to kind of brush by it. But uh, by the end, the, the an uh, answer is pretty clear what happens. And it's, it's not good. <laughs> so that was something you weren't initially planning on doing. But at what point did you think to yourself, screw it, let's do it? Um, I think... I don't know when we decided that that I think it was like issue I think it was writing issue one or, or at the very least writing issue two that we decided that that was kind of the logical he was going to be the ultimate protagonist of this or the ultimate antagonist of this first arc and like that's kind of how it needed to to go um you know he's he's sort of been lurking as you know kind of a skis ball uh, throughout the first couple of issues and then he becomes more more relevant uh, in issue three and four and five uh, but yeah how obviously you sit there and you're like well he's just a person and and the 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 action of the story is giant mechs and and kaiju how are you going to turn it into that and we we're like well this makes a lot of sense <laughs> <laughs> so because of the age group of the comic where did you determine the line was well, I mean, we, we, you know, we pass ideas back and forth all the time and, uh, and, and sort of played with a couple different variations on what it could be. Uh, How gruesome did it get out yeah. before you, you, you pared it back a little bit? Well, I think, I think we sort of, uh, you know, joked that it would be kind of a, a gruesome, horrible thing. And that might play as if nothing else kind of a lip service gag of just like oh imagine how how bad that could be um you know that that's just a level of body horror you don't <laughs> expect uh and then subverting that in the actual action of what happens was was a lot of fun uh but we knew 
you know, we because we we have we've done horror series before. Like we know when it's time to break out the the gross out and the the you know uh, truly horrifying imagery. And this is just isn't a series that appreciates that all that much. Uh, so we knew we couldn't you know turn him inside out or anything like that. Like we could, nothing horrible could happen to to Mister Moore um, that wasn't like kid appropriate. Uh, so, so pretty immediately we were like, well, we're not going to go that far with it. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I think it was just a, a gradual kind of, you know, what feels right for the book. And that's sort of how it went the entire way, uh, uh, writing Mechaton was we would, I would, I would put in jokes and I would put in kind of situations that we would then take a look at and go, you know, this just doesn't, you know, it feels a little bit too, uh, I guess edgy would be the word like, hmm. you know, maybe at home in like uh, a, a 13 year old kid in the two thousands idea of a cool, like <laughs> uh, mecca show, but like, you know, jokes that were maybe a little bit more adult than we, than we wanted. And we just realized, ah, eh, you know, it feels a little bit better if we pull it back. Um, not because there's anything wrong with raunchy jokes, just because it didn't feel right for, for this, uh, this book and what we were doing with it. So, I mean, obviously, the, the premise is whoever gets punched by the glove turns into a usable mech. Mm -hmm. when, we, when you look at more, is he more of a mech or more of a kaiju? Considering he's a oh, he's a kaiju. Player. He's a kaiju. Yeah, he's definitely a kaiju. Yeah, <laughs> he turns into a he turns into a monster. Um, <laughs> turns into a cheese monster specifically, uh, and that was sort of a fun thing of like melding the you know uh, <laughs> the sort of uh, different aesthetics of of slacker culture where that that. Uh, sort of dovetails into into Derek's character where he's the kind of guy who would who spends all day eating pizza and, and playing video games in the basement mm. uh, and then for him to fight a, a pizza monster at the end was just like beautiful poetic justice <laughs> I, I thought I just thought that was a lot of fun I mean uh, obviously the whole uh, premise it goes with um, the the phrase rule of cool which is kind right. of like, like like the main theme of what, what what goes on. So can you break that down a little bit for the for the listeners if who may not have seen previous interviews? You've been on a, a few times. I know we talked about Megaton. Before. Sure. Yeah. No. Rule of Cool is sort of our philosophy uh, uh, going with Megaton, but it's it's sort of a more grounded version of Rule of Cool than than a lot of things will do. The idea is just if it's cool, it works. Uh, <laughs> we we don't have to explain it. You don't have to think about it too hard. Uh, why is it that way? Because it's awesome. Um, and that was sort of the, 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 the founding principle of the glove. Why, why, how is the glove able to turn anything it punches into a, uh, into a mech? Why are you asking these questions? It doesn't matter. It's cool. It gets to do that. Let's tell a fun story with that. It's At the same time, we, yeah. <laughs> At the same time, we didn't want to push it so far that you know nothing matters and and like things needed to have consequences there, there needed to be consistent rules um but those rules are a little bit bananas on the whole so like another you know sort of uh, uh example of what i would call rule of cool is like uh scott pilgrim uh that series like does not exist in reality it things go off the wall very quickly uh people start flying and and punching holes through walls and doing anime fights but it all still works within the realm of trying to tell this kind of specific story. Uh, and it, it never feels like it's breaking its own rules. Uh, it just feels like it sort of lives on a different level of existence than, than the rest of us get to. Yeah, like I say, like I say the Superman, there's no reason why he can act. I, I get the flight idea, so someone, but not the hovering. There's nothing that he's doing physically that allows him to hover. It, it doesn't, unless he's propelling himself through methods we don't uh, aware of, like maybe he does like a little like, foot flap maybe to keep himself uh, like airborne or something but it doesn't make any sense in, in any real way whatsoever yeah nothing else in nature w like works like that so why right. yeah why would he be able to and but like again it's it's yeah it's it doesn't ultimately matter it's 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 cool to see him hovering you get some iconic imagery and it would be silly if he was like doing a little doggy paddle to keep himself up in the air you know, it would that would kind of undercut the 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 cool factor. Well, I agree, but like again, look, look at Spider Man. He's got the boots on, but I get that he has sticky things in his fingers. But he's got boots on, so is the sticky things oozing through yeah. the boots? Does he have little feelers that go through the boots? It's not well explained. It's like, yeah, shut up. It's fine. <laughs> it works. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> 
But that's, uh, that's, what, that's what makes it fun. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 not about uh, you know how does everything break down logically all the time. It's sometimes it's about this is what we need to do to tell the story. Let's get to the interesting bits. Mm. And I and I I think we talked about this a little earlier in an earlier interview is that uh, about Mecha Time is that one of the fun things about this comic is seeing what things would look like as a mech. Mm -hmm. you know, I think he punched. Was it was a hot hot um, hot dog uh, stand? I think he got punched. Yeah, like, so there's the, the hot dog mech. stand is sort of the the iconic first uh, right. mech that we do. That's the one on the covers, and uh, yeah, it's that one looks really good, and it's just a, just such a good encapsulation of kind of the uh, inherent silliness of the concepts. Like it's just inherently kind of uh, fun and ridiculous. Uh, the fact that you have this sleek looking mech, but also it has a big hot dog on its chest and its weapons are, you know, an umbrella shield and a, a condiment cannon and a brat buster. It's like, it doesn't, it, it, it does a, such a good job of just capturing the concept and, and sort of the angle we were going for on it, that it, it wound up becoming sort of the mascot of the series. <laughs> so I mean, one of the things, um, as the story has gone on and the, and the support cast um, grows and develops, Mm -hmm. how did you determine where how to balance the characterization and the plot and at what level of complexity you want to give the characters given the type of story once again you can't have i think you know i mean there's some aspects i'm sure you, you didn't want to dive into because it might have been too serious or too deep where was the level you thought this is about as deep as you want to get into the character before you get to the where the comic book is not fun you know maybe young adult it's more it becomes too you know real Right. I think I think you have to respect the characters and let them sort of uh, be like fully realized three dimensional mm. versions of themselves. Um, because if you don't, suddenly it's it a little bit feels like you're, you know, uh, rushing past things to get to the fun bits or mm. you're you're talking down to the audience, uh, to the reader. And I, in my opinion, that's the word, that's the biggest way to, to, to kill a story. Um, so I, I, you know, the, 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 the characters all have wants and backstories and, and personality traits. And we look for moments to let those shine through, uh, even in keeping with the, you know, kind of high octane action of the book. Uh, and if we didn't do that, uh, we would miss out on a lot of really cool stuff that nuance, like the, the the details of their lives and their experiences colors so much of of how they act in the book that uh, it's it really feels like it would be missing something if we just said, you know, these are their names and all you need to know about them is they punch stuff. Um, you know, one of my uh, favorite moments from from issue two is uh, we uh them talking to uh leah's uh partner hex who at up until now hasn't been a part of of any of this nonsense uh and she says i don't know if you would believe me if i told you what was going on and uh hex says something to the effect of like uh my parents come from a country where a math teacher told everyone to start killing each other and they did uh, so I'm, my tolerance for what I can believe is pretty high. Uh, they are Cambodian, uh, which is like, that's a gruesome reality, but it is also just like a part of their history. And that makes for, I think, a more interesting character. It's not like that we didn't make them Cambodian to deliver that line. That was just kind of an accident of like, well, what would they say? <laughs> I would say I'm I'm fully capable of of embracing some weirdly bizarre stuff. Like if you tell me something weird happened, it's probably not stranger than like my actual history here. And for listeners who do know, pick up a history book, right? <laughs> yeah. If you, so, yeah. Um, that's that's uh, it's called the Khmer Rouge, and it was a <laughs> it was a whole thing that happened uh, that was uh, quite horrific, but. Uh, sort of left its mark on an entire uh, generation of of South Asian uh, 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 people. So, all that aside, um, yeah, no, I, I I think giving them those complexities doesn't take away from the action. It it adds more context and flavor to it, and it makes you, it allows you to sort of relate to them and, and glom onto them a little bit more. And that's what I like about Megaton. It's both action and educational. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, educational but not in a very special episode kind of way although that would be a fun <laughs> maybe we should do a short that's just with, the, with very... the more you know pops up like over yeah exactly and we just we stop the entire episode if someone pulls out like a little bit of, of weed or something and what <laughs> well hey spider not... pulled that up player man pulled that off um <laughs> in the 70s you can, you can do that exactly with, why not Kids at elementary school is getting the first issue of Mechaton, special drug issue of Mechaton to pass out to all the kids at the school. The very, yeah, the very special <laughs> episode <laughs> where suddenly it's, it's yeah, suddenly it goes from a comedy to a, to some kind of weird psychodrama. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all that aside. <laughs> so the, the art on the series is Fernando Pinto? Yes. Now, a lot of I, I find it, maybe it's just my experience, and maybe it's, it's my experience could be bias or warped, or who knows. But it feels like it's a lot of indie, um, or it's more rare for in the indie world to keep have the same artist who keeps keeps on the entire series. But you've had the yeah. opportunity to do that with a I know I've had a few where it's been like you know back and forth, someone can't do work or whatever. How has building a relationship with your artist help you make the, a better product? Oh well, Nando has such a strong eye for style and character and his expressions are, are so bright uh that the more we've worked with him the more trust we've been able to put in him um you know we, and the first script that we wrote had was very very uh detailed and every panel had a lot of of description and we were very like careful to explain everything and, and make sure that the uh there was no ambiguity uh, and as we've worked with uh, Fernando, we've been able to ease up on that to the point that in uh, our in the, the script for issue six, which is written, uh, there's two pages that are just, you know, this is a fight. Here's roughly what needs to happen. Have fun with it. Mm. Uh, we'll put in the dialogue later. Um, yeah, it's 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 a lot of trust and it's a lot of uh, of you know getting to see the the comic grow as a result. Uh, and every Nando makes everything that we put into the script better just by by virtue of being a brilliant artist. So, uh, yeah, cultivating that relationship has been really, really rewarding. It's definitely made the book a lot better. Uh, and there's been a couple of exam of instances where uh, characters have changed based on how Nando decides to draw them. Uh, we did not plan for Hex to be as sort of uh no nonsense and stern as they are uh but because of the sort of uh nando just kept drawing them with these like unimpressed like whatever kind of faces and we realized that that's such a better dynamic than what we had originally planned between them and derek especially but also leah who are both really high energy uh you know take nothing seriously kind of characters mm -hmm. So, once again, going back to the idea of all the different mechs that you do, how much are you explained to him what it's going to look like, and how much is he just like, or are you just like hot dog stand mech? And they're like, he's like, gotcha. I mean, that's pretty much it. Is yeah, we we say <laughs> we say you know we want it, like it's a hot dog cart mech. I I think the only note we ever really gave to uh to to Nando, especially at first, was like this mech looks too sleek. It looks too done. It looks too purposefully made, and we wanted it to look a little bit slapdash and thrown together. Uh, and he managed to do that without making it look like you know uncool. It still looks like I want that as an action figure. Uh, it's just a little bit less like streamlined than mm. than it originally was because story wise we didn't want them to be making like perfect looking mechs. It's literally about throwing together whatever you have to to deal with your problem. So mm. it made more sense to us that it was a little bit rougher around the edges. Uh, other than that, yeah, it's it's this is a hot dog. Make it look like a mech, <laughs> you know, whatever that means to you. Has he ever responded back to you? Are you sure? Are you crazy? What the hell's wrong? <laughs> no, no. Nando's a hundred percent on board. Uh, and I love working with Nando. He's he's really uh, super positive, uh, both in uh, his temperament and his in his uh, attitude toward the book. Um, and and part of the reason why we worked with him is because we had seen uh, some of his other work, uh, stuff like Gun Punch, which 
actually is is also about to hit Kickstarter. Uh, is like we some of the art from that is very you know uh, uh, playing with like uh, big guns morphing from out of limbs and and stuff like that. And something about it just told us, yeah, this guy gets the idea of just making something that looks wrong or like you know uh, transforming. Uh, things in really unique and creative ways. Now, you mentioned um, that you have some ideas uh, for issue six. Is there going to be a volume two, uh, two do you think? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, definitely, uh, eventually we may take a small uh, break from Mechaton after this first volume, but uh, we we have an, a story overall and I, I'll be on my favorite thing that happens in the series happens in the second arc. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to let us uh, not tell that part mm. of the story. I'm at least getting that far. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if, uh, if it, if it goes further than that, that would be amazing. Uh, but the, these first three arcs that we have, I, I really want to be able to, to get out there and, and tell a complete story. So, so, so um, volume one obviously is on Kickstarter right now. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of uh, rewards um, or your favorites? Which ones did you, as you're going along, you thought, wow, this would really be a cool reward and has made it, what wasn't made in an earlier one is now definitely something that's on your uh, campaigns for now on? Sure. Uh, well, we, the, the thing that we were able to do with this one that we haven't been able to do in the past is uh, include more back matter. So our deluxe edition, which has the uh, exclusive cover from Jason Murr, who's the uh, artist behind By the Horns, which is one of my favorite indie books uh, on the shelves right now. Uh, that one has a lot more, uh, like it has a full page breakdown. So you can see sort of the, uh, uh, the, the creative process from on as a script to thumbnails to all the way to finished letters done um and everyone gets to sort of chip in and and explain what they did to make the page work um we do that we have sample pages that no one's seen before uh from an entirely different art team uh so kind of a look into what the book could have looked like we have uh some story concepts that uh were sort of the original idea behind mechaton that we eventually morphed into this uh, an art gallery. There's there's so much stuff that you can, uh, if you're a fan of the series or if you're just really into that kind of thing, uh, is open and available for you. And that's with the Deluxe Edition and with the Hollow Foil uh, Deluxe Edition. Uh, you can uh, get a look at that. So when will the action figure come out? <laughs> well, once we figure out how to make one uh, what in, in a uh, cost-effective way. <laughs> okay, see, that's, that's the trick. They're, 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 I, I know they can be done, but cost-effective... Is has always been the uh, catch yeah, those right. if if we could sell a hundred thousand of them, absolutely we could we could, make them. <laughs> but like yeah, just the the way it is making uh, making ten or even a hundred is is sometimes a little bit too expensive to justify. But yeah, I would love to have some that to, to have or, some action figures or 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 plushy toy. Ooh ooh uh, 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 a more um, slime guy. <laughs> Um, plushy toy. <laughs> I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to think which ones would be good uh, plushies because the, the mechs feel like maybe they're a little bit too jagged for that. But maybe the maybe Diehedipod, the the giant roach, mm. or the 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 big mosquito <laughs> <laughs> combination. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, yeah, but... again, I th these are all things I would love to do. Uh, or I'd love to look into. It's just th th that's a matter of we need more people loving the book in order to yeah. to make those things so since that you know this is your 10th campaign i believe yeah yeah 10th kickstarter campaign kickstarter as veterans of kickstarter what advice do you have for the rest of us who are trying to get our books out there and sold uh geez um I I have written a couple of articles about uh, Kickstarter, it, like things that I wish I knew when I was starting Kickstarter. I also uh, do Kickstarter consultations uh, uh, for a fee, but still like to, to walk you through, uh, you know, your, your campaign page as well as what to expect before, during and after. Um, if there's one piece of advice it would that I have, it would be uh, like steal shamelessly, not 
your book, obviously that needs to be your, you know, kind of creative birthright and whatnot. Uh, but in terms of look at other campaigns that are succeeding and figure out what they do, what they look like, what works for you, what doesn't. Uh, and that goes from everything from the page design, uh, to how they're like, how they're promoting the campaign, what, you know, what kind of shows they're going on or, or where, what, sites they're promoting it on um to their uh pricing for their books and just everything down the line um the the more information you can get but from what's already working the less risks you have to take when you actually go out and do it yourself mm. so between what dates is the megaton volume one running for so megaton volume one is currently running uh and it will be uh finished on uh, March 6th at 12 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the last full day will be Tuesday the 5th. All right. And for our listeners, uh, there'll be a link in the YouTube um, episode. So definitely make sure you click on Kickstarter. How about Megatem? Especially if you want to see the second volume. And we need enough people to get the action figure made. So guys, pay up. <laughs> Thank Let's you, do it. Mr. Thompson. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. All right. Have a very good night, sir. You too. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Diversity Stars podcast. Please help me battle the algorithms by liking and subscribing. Be sure to return for next episode when Talia Tran boards the mothership to discuss Avatar The Last Airbender. Until next voyage, travel on. <laughs>